Hello and a very warm welcome to Bharata First. You're watching Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Since you're here, I would like to thank you for your continued support. For those of you who haven't already subscribed, please like the video, subscribe, hit the bell icon and then all notifications. Do follow our social media handles for all the latest updates and you can also subscribe to our newsletter to get some incisive content. The Bharata First team is running a daily quiz, so do participate in the Big Picture quiz as well. Now, here are the UPI IDs for those of you who would like to come forward and contribute. A small contribution that you make will be a giant leap for us to keep bringing you this content. Do continue to show your love and support. All the information is in the description of this video, so please go through it. Now, on to the discussion. China's aggressive policies haven't gone down too well with democracies around the world. New Zealand's parliament unanimously declared last week that severe human rights abuses were taking place under Uyghur people in China's Xinjiang region, spurring the Chinese embassy to decry the move as interference in internet affairs. Now, meanwhile, Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro said that uh, the novel coronavirus may have been created to wage biological warfare in a veiled reference to China. Australia and China ties have uh, also had a very rough time in the recent past. And we all know about the differences that India and China have been having. India's case is different. The anger for the others, however, stems from the fact that the world economy has collapsed, but China has managed to do well. In this edition of Big Picture, we will analyze how democracies around the world are miffed with China. Joining me on the program today are Manjeev Puri, former ambassador, Jaydev Ranade, President, Center for China Analysis and Strategy, and Harshvi Panth, Head Strategic Studies, Observer Research Foundation. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of Big Picture. Mr. Ranade, I'd like to start the program with you first. You know, we've seen in the recent past that uh, democracies around the world are clearly miffed with what China is doing and are upset with what China has brought to the table, really. We saw, we saw the resolution being passed in New Zealand. We saw that China walked out of the economic deal with economic pact with Australia. Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil has called uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and he's questioned the origins of uh, the COVID-19 virus and he has called it biological warfare. Your thoughts on all this that's happening? Uh, let me um, first uh, say, uh, Frank, that uh, the root, I think, of China's problems are not only its aggressive behavior, but the COVID pandemic has added to uh, the uh, poor image that China has or the bad image that China has. And many people, whether they say it or not, they do feel that China is responsible for what they are going through at the moment uh, in India too. But uh, how, if I may just go a bit further, I mean, uh, Xi Jinping actually is the person who, by making the declarations at the 18th and 19th Party Congress in 2012 and 17, uh, bold declarations about where he wants China to be uh, by uh, 2021 and 2049, he showed very clearly that he wants to be perceived by the Chinese people and others probably as the child of red destiny. I mean, he wanted to fulfill the uh, dreams of the Chinese communist revolutionary forebears. Uh, his father was one. And uh, therefore, he is also a man in a hurry. Uh, because he set benchmarks as to where he wants to go. And this includes uh, recovery of uh, lost territories, bringing China back to its so-called old glory days. I say so-called because historically there weren't any. But in the process, he, what he's doing is he's treading on a good many toes. He's encroaching on the strategic space of countries in uh, the Indo-Pacific. He's uh, trying to uh, take over and we need dominant power in the South China Sea. All this obviously has upset a lot of people. And finally, in conclusion, let me just mention that the way he's propagating that uh, community of shared destiny, that the Chinese model is the model and the Western democracies are not shaping up. He is presenting China as an alternate. These things have irked the Western powers and the United States also. Absolutely. All right, Professor, let me bring you in now. We've also seen, uh, you know, uh, more initiatives apart from the Quad. We saw the uh, supply chain resilience initiative also take more shape now. So clearly, uh, you know, the world is trying to get alternatives really as far as China is concerned. And they seem to be, uh, you know, in a hurry to try and 
keep China at bay because they are worried about what China may become in the years to come. Uh, yes, I think what uh, Frank, what we seem to be witnessing is perhaps uh, you know that uh, you know that so-called inflection point that many were waiting for in terms of when would it come, uh, what would be that moment where the world would really look at look at China in a, in a really realistic uh, and hard way and start recalibrating. I think COVID-19 accelerated those trends that were early visible. So whether you know whether you, whether you look at it from a structural perspective about uh, great power transition and what kind of a role China is going to play in the global governance architecture, or today when you talk of COVID, you look at it more personally. You know how an individual is uh, feeling the pain and the distress uh, of uh, health crisis, wealth crisis, economic dislocation, multiple problems that you are facing at multiple levels. Uh, at, at some point, they relate to this to this big idea that China is really at the heart of many of these problems. Uh, and and as uh, uh, you know, Mr. Rana, they said whether you say it out loud or not, there is an inherent feeling uh, in the body politic uh, around the world, as well as even in you know common individuals who perhaps have, have had nothing to do with China before. That certainly there is something wrong with the model that China is trying to advance and that China is trying to uh, you know put for, put forth. And and therefore the pushback that we are now, that we are now looking is much more substantive. You know when you talked of Quad. Quad was rejected earlier by the same countries, but today we, it has been resurrected and it has been pushed forward in ways that was that is quite unprecedented. Similarly, whether you look at it, multiple geometries in the Indo-Pacific that are emerging, all kinds of uh, trilaterals that are emerging, whether you're looking at the initiatives, for example, to manage uh, supply chain resilience, different again, this, the supply chain resilience initiative, the idea being uh, at the very heart that you cannot be over dependent on a country like China, which can which can wreak havoc. Uh, when when the time comes uh, on on the larger global economic order, so countries I think are are willing now to push those buttons that were that they were reluctant to earlier, uh, and they were they are willing to challenge China on some of the key issues that perhaps they were reluctant to earlier. You know, you, you have seen uh, you talked of New Zealand and Australia, but you also see that in U European Union, which is again a, a block that had been reluctant to 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 challenge China, but we saw how. After passing the the investment agreement in December, they've now said they've postponed that ratification. So there is something happening. I mean, again, I don't, I, you know, I don't know how that will co how this all will coalesce together and what kind of an architecture will emerge. But certainly, most countries, most powers, most especially democracies around the world, are looking at a greater degree of fragmentation in the global order, economic, uh, structural, uh, as well as uh, ideological. And that fragmentation leads to its own sets of consequences, whether they are institutional, what kind of institutions these countries perhaps would be creating, or whether what kind of bilateral and trilateral arrangements they are going to come with each other, come to terms with each other, so that the larger issue of China can be tackled. So I think we are in that phase uh, where uh, something is going to happen. Uh, and clearly countries are readying the pitch, readying the battlefield, but it's not entirely evident at the moment how far and, and to what purpose that would be served. Absolutely. Ambassador, you've heard both the other panelists speak before you on this particular subject. Let's hear your thoughts. Uh, Frank, thank you very much. You know, one has to agree with what uh, Mr. Ranade said and what Professor Pan said. Look, there is a an underlying kind of feeling in the world that this Wuhan virus has affected us. This is one thing. Secondly, we all need to understand that in a sense, China is the demandeur. After all, it has become the la second largest economy in the world, I, maybe third largest. If I take the EU as a single unit, it will become the largest economy in the world. There is a changing global order. Let us also remember one thing. While the rest of the world has suffered hugely under COVID, look how well the Chinese have done. Look at what their economic growth rate in the first quarter of this year has been. Unbelievable kind of rates. Let me also draw your attention to something else. The WTO recently finally managed to elect a new director general. Who does she appoint? An American and a Chinese. I think we also need to understand that in large parts of the world, geopolitics has its place and it will be played out. Economics has its place and it will be played out. But the attempt, especially of the Americans, despite you know some little ruckus during the Alaska meeting, etc., is one that roped them in into a global rules-based order. Uh, they are an important player. They are a player of various consequences. Let me even draw your attention to India. We've had some of the biggest and most difficult contestations with them last year. And yet, being strong, being resolute, 
being forceful, we have managed to get them to also turn around a little bit. But on our own part, also we made some little changes. There was a very tough one. No, no investments by China. Nothing will happen. Yes, I read something about it also the other day. But slowly but surely, we are also allowing them to invest in some railway infrastructure. We are also letting them do other things good things because I'm afraid that's the nature of the global economy and you need to build your own resilience. So China is there to stay. China also needs to realize that if it needs to be part of the world, it needs to start playing by a more equitable, more understanding set of rules. But the rest of the world coalescing together is important and I believe democracy is coming together is certainly a very, very big poll. For me, the transatlantic alliance continues to remain the most important element. When they push together, many, many things are in a position to happen. Now, the Europeans may have pushed back the agreement with China on investment, but frankly, also see back China. Let's look at the economy. Let's look at the supply chains which are there. Let's look at what they can contribute in the world. So I think we need to understand that there are changes and shifts which are taking place. But these shifts have to have China accommodating the world and the world also making a certain amount of space for China. Absolutely. Let's let's talk about India, uh, Mr. Ranade. And, you know, since the ambassador brought up India, we also know that India has decided to keep Chinese companies, uh, you know, Huawei and uh, ZTE out of the 5G trials as well. Uh, how would you look at this uh, decision and this move? Because in the past two, We've seen that Australia and the UK have been very vocal about Chinese 5G, Chinese companies as far as 5G is concerned. Well, I think um, this decision was, to my view, overdue. Uh, we should have made it explicit even earlier. But the circumstances today, the manner in which the Chinese troops are massed on the border and they suddenly came, I think these have uh, precipitated uh, the decision, which is good. Uh, to come to another point about Chinese investments in India, uh, India has decided now that they are going to look at every Chinese investment that comes in, whether as a subcontractor or whether directly. And those that we feel are in our interest, those we feel are not going to impact our security, those are going to be allowed. As far as Huawei and ZTE is concerned, are concerned, you would, you would appreciate that they uh, they're participating in 5G or even their presence as it is today in our telecom sector actually renders one of our most critical uh, sectors vulnerable to Chinese uh, intrusion or Chinese activity, uh, which are undesirable. There are enough cases of Huawei having been caught with its hand in the espionage till. And um, I think uh, we, have, uh, we are aware of that. So uh, we are going to move very gingerly. The third factor is the total absence of trust now. Whatever trust there was, whatever efforts were going on to build it, I think now are dissipated. And to my mind, at least, whatever relationship we have with China has to be now built anew. And uh, it will take a long time. The absence of trust will uh, hamper the development. But yes, we will try and keep uh, certain uh, aspects of the relationship going. And finally, I think there is no two ways, but the government will start moving and has already to uh, isolate our critical sectors, including pharma, as we are seeing right now, from uh, dependence on the Chinese production lines. Absolutely. <clears throat> Professor, let me come back to you now and let's talk about this aspect once again. You know, it's already been raised on the program, but if you look at it, each and every one of these democracies is so dependent on China because of economic factors. So how far can these countries go really to take on China without having their own economies being impacted? Uh, you know, uh, Frank, this is a calculation I think that democracies uh, are now reassessing because uh, if you recall uh, a lot, you know, in the past before COVID struck us the way it has um, in the last year or so, 
the discussion was that look we have to manage china's rise and we have to somehow see uh, that there are benefits to which which are very legitimate benefits that every every uh, democracy has when it engages with china in the economic space and cooperation with china allows those benefits uh, to come forth now the challenge i think that has happened or the change that has happened is i think in the in the west in particular if you see uh, even in india this debate between economic uh, security and national security has merged uh, you know there is this a very interesting article that jake sullivan wrote for example before he became uh, uh, you know the national security advisor uh, to president biden uh, wherein he said you know uh, unless the western world especially america starts looking at uh, economic security through a national security prism we will be we will always be at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the chinese so clearly and and you know those uh, you know mr trump highlighted it in his own ways when he used to talk about it he was uh, you know he was uh, not very you know his argumentation was not very sophisticated but i think at the end of the day the arguments across trump and biden administration have remained the same uh, when uh, you know uh, uh, the biden administration says that the prism through which they are going to evaluate their foreign policy is what that foreign policy does to american middle classes they are sending out a message that ultimately their economic policy will be driven by the uh, you know by what happens within the uh, you know uh, what what happens in the american hinterland when it comes to economic prosperity or economic security so i think when you look at you know trade technology domains and you look at how uh, china has been able to exploit the advantages that were given by open societies to a country like china and how that lack of reciprocity has led to the situation that china can you know generate a lot of benefits without actually granting the same rights to others that has actually led to a whole host of problems for a large uh, part of the world especially the western developed world and countries like india where china operates very very openly in in, in a number of areas where we you know as, as a democracy we really uh, can't manage that so i think the challenge therefore becomes for open societies for liberal democracies is how do we make sure that that uh, you know that you know that that line needs uh, th those red lines are respected and by, by china by putting pressure on china in certain ways and also by making sure that china is not allowed or is not present in certain sectors which can be key if you recall one of the first things that uh, prime minister modi said last year uh, was uh, one of the most important lessons we have learned is self reliance and you know in, in the context of pharmaceutical industry for example now uh, i don't think complete dissociation with china is neither feasible nor desirable as far as economics is concerned nor is it going to yield as uh, any benefits nor i think uh, this is the template that any other country can follow but certainly when you look at countries like australia which were so dependent on china that at one point they were seen as the weakest link in this chain of democracies uh, in the indo pacific today if you look at the costs that they are counting both in terms of political intervention both in terms of technological uh, regeneration i think those challenges are becoming more and more evident and those challenges will have to be managed by open liberal democracies how they manage it whether in concert uh, perhaps in concert with each other perhaps working together in developing technologies and uh, developing supply chains which can help each other but i think that is a question that i think all these open societies liberal democracies are asking and it's a challenge it's a challenge that we have to accept that it's going to be difficult but i think that's that's where the debate seems to be moving uh, again mm -hmm. i don't know the resolution but i think the debate seems to have a certain trajectory as far as uh, open societies and liberal democracies are concerned and that's a that's a trajectory that's quite evident today let me build on that point and take it forward with you ambassador you know uh, of course um, china is the largest trading partner as far as australia and new zealand are concerned so you know considering that aspect were you surprised at all with new zealand going ahead and passing that resolution in parliament the kind of language that yair bolsonaro has used you know over the last few days and there's a certain uh, philippines uh, diplomat who's been using some very aggressive language against china as well so you know how would you look at all of this frank you know i don't want to comment on jair bolsonaro and his democratic credential line so i think let's leave that out look the new zealanders had their own perspectives their own domestic needs and so have the australians how far they'll be able to go how far they'll be able to take these things i don't know because these relationships were built not just by china but were built assiduously by the australians who benefited tremendously remember if apple is the world's most valuable company it's because 
in China, their largest manufacturer takes place. I think we need to understand this quite well and remember that this entire debate of the trade and the flag, etc., are very old issues. At the end of the day, these well-heeled Western democracies, they are very much about economics. Let's not forget the famous thing, it's all about economics too, but, you know, and they know where their interests lie. They also have other advantages. The trans-Pacific, there's a huge old relationship there. They are also countries with tremendous resilience themselves, large, solid economies that they are. So they, they know how to play the game. The Europeans, too, are very much in this particular kind of business. How aggressive have you seen the Japanese versus the Chinese, for example? How aggressive have you seen the South Koreans, for example? What the point that I'm trying to make to you is that China needs to understand that it can't be simply my way or the highway for others. That won't happen. The world has figured out that you are no longer a challenge that can be managed, but that you are now a serious competitive challenge and we will take you on. They need to realize, the world also needs to realize it, and the Chinese also need to perhaps uh, try and do a certain degree of change in their strategy. Will they do it? Will they not? Perhaps not, because as Mr. Ranade says, the current person leading China has a certain worldview of himself, the legacy that he wishes to bestow. He might just, you know, let me say, tip it over. But we all need to understand. Incidentally, on India, if you just look at the trade figures from April last year to January of this year, the latest set of trade figures, China is number one in terms of our imports. You know, I mean, by a very small number as over, over and above the European Union. So there are realities and these realities should not be forgotten, especially when we have these discussions on what we call national security, diplomacy, etc. The realities of life are something of this kind. Look at the kind of capital required in India, whether for Atam Nirbhar or anything. I think you and I are very happy using Paytm. Do we know where it is? Do we know where Baijus comes from? I'm giving you simple, straightforward examples of the way things actually are on the ground. I know you're smiling, but that's the reality. And sometimes in these very esoteric kind of debates, we tend to forget this. So let's be very realistic, important, rein them in. But I'm afraid they are there. And we need to work with them. We all need to work with them. We need to see what we can do. I like that word. Action has to be taken gingerly, has to be taken sophisticatedly. You let some in, you stop some. You really have to do this much better. Absolutely. All right. Time to get closing comments from all my panelists with the best way forward. Starting first with you, Mr. Ranade. Well, um, I think more or less everything has been said. But let me just make two points. Democracies normally take longer to react than authoritarian regimes or totalitarian regimes. And we have seen that just now. Despite Chinese aggressiveness, despite Chinese uh, pushing, despite the Chinese behaving uh, irresponsibly, it has taken the West and it has taken us quite some time. If I may just make one point to reinforce what Harsh uh, said about uh, national security and economics uh, uh, coming together or being viewed either through different prisms or the same. The fact is that in India, the uh, view has been divided for a long time. But it is Chinese actions, aggression, which has actually uh, merged the two and uh, got us to look, uh, in my view, correctly so, uh, with national security being the overarching uh, uh, view and economics coming into it. Secondly, I quite agree that we cannot isolate China from uh, uh, the, re the world economics, I don't think that's the intention anywhere. Everyone wants to also penetrate the Chinese market, at least the West does. And as uh, so I think China will be there. The problem is an aggressive China. Once that goes, which means that once Xi Jinping modulates his so-called dreams, then I think there is scope for a modus vivendi. But uh, in my view, I think the West will drive home a very sharp lesson to the Chinese, if not today, tomorrow. Professor? 
Uh, Frank, I would just say that, you know, at times uh, we think, oh, my God, Chinese are these great strategists. They have done everything very right. But look at what look at what is happening today. Not a single country around their periphery likes them. Uh, and there is a, you know, we are talking about uh, the democracies joining hands together. If only, I mean, if you are if you are an outsider and I'm not a diplomat, if I'm sitting outside as, a, as, a, as an observer of these trends, uh, you know, even I can feel that there is something wrong with the way they are going about it diplomatically. If they had had they played their cards relatively more sophisticatedly, as Ambassador Puri is saying, perhaps this ganging up would not have would not be happening. Even Europeans and Americans, uh, you know, do not see eye to eye on China. I mean, there are there are there are shades of differences there which they can exploit. But I think this overtly aggressive behavior, this overt belligerence, this idea of demeaning other countries publicly, the wolf warrior diplomacy, that has sort of shaken up a lot of the, uh, you know, the larger international community's faith that China can modulate itself, that Xi Jinping can modulate himself. And I think that that perhaps is a challenge both for China and the international community, because if, if Mr. Xi Jinping cannot modulate his behavior, then we have a real problem at hand. We can all talk about, uh, you know, managing China, but he has, he's on his own uh, trip and is, is on his own destination. For the for the, for Chinese, this is a problem because uh, the, the rest of the world will certainly uh, start ganging up, will start making some demands and will start making a case uh, that, look, uh, we have to find alternatives. We may not be able to completely dissociate ourselves from China, but, uh, you know, look, if 5G is not allowed in uh, in India, if, if Huawei is not allowed in uh, in India, then that's a big loss. It's a big market for for China. So clearly, I think there are you know there are quick costs and benefits on both sides as to what is happening. But uh, you know, as I think the broader point has been made, that this is also about uh, you know broader shift within China as well as larger structural shift in the international system. Sometimes structural shifts are very difficult to manage. We we we, all, we don't want. I think no leader wants a war, but at, wars happen because there are structural shifts. Uh, and because great powers rise and fall and they do not always rise and fall peacefully. So I think that the larger challenge for diplomats is how do you make sure that those larger ships are managed well and managed sophisticatedly, as Ambassador Puri is suggesting. Yeah, absolutely. And Ambassador Puri also has a big smile on his face. So Ambassador, close the show for us with your concluding remarks. And also, I think this is a very valid point that has been made and that has been raised. Clearly, we can't do without China. But China's belligerent policies right now have left a bad taste in everyone's mouth. And that's something that everybody wants to change. Frank, you know, I, of course, agree very much with Professor Pant. To China, let alone Xi Jinping. But I would say this, that, you know, time is actually on their side, at least for another 20, 30 years. And therefore, if they played the game a little more sophisticatedly, a bit more of managing to get into the world. Their situation is very good because democracy is on their side. Today, technology is on their side. They are par for the course with anyone. The rest of the people have all kinds of issues coming up in front of them. So if I leave India out of this particular picture among the guys who are above $15 trillion in that small little group of three uh, groups, they have everything on their side. But if you do this kind of belligerence, then, you know, I can only say this expression that you should be very mindful that you could slip. And perhaps COVID was that slipping point. I really don't know. But I leave it to you. All right, gentlemen, we'll have to leave to that. Thank you so much for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. What's coming out of this discussion is that there is no doubt that the world is miffed with China. But it is also a fact that uh, not much can be done as it all comes down to economics. New Zealand Foreign Minister has already said that they want a mature relationship with China trying to bury the hatchet. Beijing, though, needs to act more maturely if it doesn't want to be antagonized further. India needs to be watchful as we can't change geography and we have to live with that fact. Once again, thank you for your continued support. For those of you who haven't already subscribed, please like the video, subscribe, hit the bell icon and then all notifications. Do follow our social media handles for all the latest updates and you can also subscribe to our newsletter to get some incisive content. The Bharata First team is running a big picture quiz, so do participate in it. Here are the UPI IDs for those of you who would like to come forward and contribute. A small contribution that you make will be a giant leap for us to keep bringing you this content. So do continue to show your love and support. All this information is in the description of the video, so please go through the description. That's it for me. See you again next time.
Thank you.